Foundation of Canada is pleased to provide the new educational materials on this video. Whether you have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, or have a friend or family member who does, we hope that our video series will help demystify these conditions. In this presentation, we explore nutrition as it relates to the diseases. Inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, describe two similar yet distinct conditions, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. They are chronic inflammatory disorders which can strike anyone, regardless of age, race, or gender. There's no known cause or cure for these painful and unpredictable diseases, but the CCFC is working hard to change that. We are a national volunteer-driven foundation that provides support through education, fellowship, and fundraising to find the cure for IBD. And we will find the cure for IBD. Each year, we invest millions of dollars in world-class medical research initiatives to help us reach that goal. The Canadian medical, research, and health communities are key partners in our research and educational efforts. In just a moment, you'll meet a gastroenterologist and a dietitian who have graciously agreed to provide their expertise in the area of nutrition for IBD. Dr. Joanne Allard is an associate professor of medicine and nutritional sciences at the University of Toronto and a staff gastroenterologist and director of the nutrition support program for the University Health Network in Toronto. Linda Kirsta is a clinical registered dietitian. In ulcerative colitis, you have uh, inflammation of the large bowel only, so that uh, you usually have a normal absorption of uh, nutrients. While in Crohn's disease, uh, you may have inflammation or complication that will affect the small bowel, and either due to narrowing of the small bowel or fistula or just inflammation, and uh, this will affect the digestion and absorption of uh, food. Uh, both diseases will uh, cause diarrhea, and uh, therefore you may have losses of proteins, water, electrolytes. Um, in ulcerative colitis, you have normal absorption of food uh, in the small bowel, but uh, the inflammation in the large bowel can create a lot of diarrhea and protein losses and blood loss that may impact on the state of nutrition. In, in Crohn's disease, because the inflammation affects the, the small bowel and can create complication like narrowing fistula, uh, it will also have an impact on nutrition by reducing absorption of nutrients uh, like protein, energy, vitamins, and water and electrolytes. Definitely, the poor nutritional status can increase the risk of complication. In both diseases, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, if you have significant weight loss, let's say over 10%, you can increase your risk of complication if you require surgery. Uh, Postoperatively, you can have an increased risk of infection, poor wound healing, wound infection. So it's very important to try to keep a normal weight. Uh, in addition, in Crohn's disease, because you have this malabsorption of food, nutrients, vitamins in the small bowel, uh, you can have some deficiencies. Um, and in addition to the weight loss you can have because of malabsorption of energy, fat, and protein, you can have also certain deficiencies like uh, zinc deficiency that may uh, increase your risk of infection as well as uh, inc contribute to the diarrhea. Uh, certain vitamins like iron, vitamin B12, folic acid can also produce anemia if you don't absorb them well. And another example is vitamin D and calcium that can create uh, osteopenia, which is lack of calcium in the bones, and increase your risk of fracture. So these malabsorption of nutrients can increase disease complication. Um, in Crohn's disease, uh, good nutrition may improve disease activity. Uh, there's uh, one study, for example, that uh, compared patients who receive intravenous nutrition with uh, oral food intake uh, to a patient with uh, just intravenous nutrition. And uh, both patients, because they improved their nutrition, also had improvement in their disease activity. So it seems to suggest that improving nutrition overall may improve uh, disease activity. In addition, in, in Crohn's disease, uh, there is a role of nutrition support, which is uh, tube feeding through the nose, which we call dental feeding, or intravenous nutrition, in reducing disease activity. It's called bowel rest, 
and if a patient is on enteral nutrition or uh, intravenous nutrition, there may be a reduction of disease activity. But it's less effective than a medication like corticosteroids or other type of medications, okay? It's important to mention, though, that in ulcerative colitis, there's no effect of uh, nutrition on uh, disease uh, activity. There's a lot of confusion in the terminology food sensitivity, food allergy, food intolerance, hypersensitivity. Uh, it's very important to define this uh, right at the beginning. Uh, you have two types of adverse reaction to food. One is involving the, your immune system, and the other one is not involving your immune system. When it's involving your immune system, we call it food allergy or food hypersensitivity. Okay? This is usually the type of reaction you will have if you eat uh, not shellfish, fish, uh, and uh, this will cause problems like hives, asthma, edema of your lips, uh, difficulty swallowing or breathing, and at times some diarrhea and abdominal pain. But it will involve the immune system. All the other type of reaction are called food intolerance. And I would probably leave out the term food sensitivity because it's kind of in between, it, uh, it's confusing. If we talk about food allergy, first of all, it's very rare. There's no evidence at all that uh, food allergy will cause inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it may happen extremely rarely that a patient with inflammatory bowel disease develop an allergy to nuts, for example, or shellfish, okay? Um, on the other hand, uh, a patient with inflammatory bowel disease can have food intolerance. Uh, one example is lactose intolerance, where uh, because of inflammation in their small bowel or a removal of a portion of their small bowel, they may have difficulty uh, tolerating dairy products. And this will present with bloating, diarrhea, uh, abdominal discomfort. Uh, so this is called food intolerance, lactose intolerance. Um, patients with Crohn's disease also can have some narrowing of their small bowel, and this uh, may cause some intolerance to fiber or some fruits and vegetables, especially if you keep the skin. So this is an intolerance. Okay, so this is the difference between allergy. Allergy, to diagnose a food allergy, uh, you need to uh, see a physician who has an expertise in this area, it's generally called an immunologist, and uh, you may need to have special tests such as food challenge and uh, skin tests, and uh, this is interpreted then by the allergist. Okay? Uh, for the food intolerance, uh, you may have any type of food that may give you some uh, reaction, but it doesn't involve your immune system. And uh, it may not also be reproducible. So that means one day you're going to eat that type of food, may give you some problems, but another day you may be able to eat that type of food without any symptoms at all. Um, when when uh, you lose weight uh, and you feel that you don't get enough nutrition, one of the first steps is to try to do manipulation of your diet to increase your calories. Uh, so usually you see a dietitian first and she will try to increase the caloric density of the food. If you cannot tolerate a normal diet, then we uh, organize oral supplementation. Again, usually this is done through a dietitian where uh, you will try several types of oral supplementation and see whether you can tolerate in a, an attempt to increase the calories uh, orally. If this doesn't work, then we have to go to step three. So step one is diet, step two is oral supplement, and then step three is nutrition support. Nutrition support, we try as much as possible to give you tube feeding. If you cannot take any oral supplementation because of nausea or lack of appetite, and you continue to lose weight. Um, this enteral nutrition is a supplementation given through a tube that is inserted usually through your nose and uh, the tip in the stomach and you get that uh, nutrition either on a continuous basis over 24 hour or just at night. Now this is often used in children because uh, it will stimulate growth and improve nutrition and may reduce the need for steroids. 
So uh, this is an important uh, uh, type of uh, treatment uh, in Crohn's disease for uh, children. If that cannot be tolerated, uh, then we go to intravenous nutrition. And uh, this is what we call parenteral nutrition. It's uh, given through a line that is inserted in your vein. And uh, we usually do this in a hospital setting. And it provides you with all the calories, nutrients, and everything. Um, and occasionally, if your complications are really uh, on a long-term basis, you may need to have intravenous nutrition or tube feeding enterally uh, at home. And that can be arranged with the dietitian and a nurse. A patient doesn't necessarily require a doctor's referral to see a dietitian. It's dependent on where the dietitian is based as to whether or not a patient requires the referral. Dietitians may be based in a hospital center, based in a health care center in the community, or based in private practice. Generally, a patient would require a doctor's referral to see a dietitian in a hospital or in a community health care center. For dietitians in private practice, generally, though, uh, a referral is not required. If a patient wishes to see a dietitian in private practice, they may consult uh, the Dietitians of Canada website and the website address is www.dietitians, spelt with a T, dot C-A. What's important to keep in mind for all patients is that their dietitian and their gastroenterologist or physician communicate with each other to share health information so that both the patient, the dietitian, and the physician can work as a team. There's no evidence that a particular food or dietary strategy can cause Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or in fact cause a flare-up. What we can say though is that when a patient is experiencing a flare that they may in fact experience food intolerances. But these food intolerances are a highly individual matter. Food intolerances are very much dependent on whether or not a patient has inflammation in their small bowel or in their large bowel. Uh, food intolerances are also dependent on whether or not a patient has experienced surgery for their disease or whether or not they've experienced a complication. What I will do is go through a series of possible intolerances that patients can experience, uh, appreciating full well that the intolerance that they may experience is very much dependent on the location of their disease. One of the uh, types of intolerances a patient can experience includes lactose intolerance. Lactose is a sugar in milk. Um, what uh, occurs is that the sugar in the milk enters into the colon, being not digested well, uh, causing cramping, bloating, and diarrhea. The treatment for this is fairly straightforward. One can add the enzyme lactase to milk to uh, make it more digestible or an individual can choose to eat uh, hard cheeses which don't contain much lactose. Uh, some patients with small bowel involvement will have a poor tolerance to simple sugars. Things like uh, uh, beverages that are highly sweetened or highly sweetened foods. The treatment for this might be to uh, dilute juices or to uh, choose instead of eating sweet foods to eat energy rich foods starchy foods such as breads, cereal, and pasta, and rice. Sorbitol and mannitol are sugar alcohols. They enter into the colon and can cause bloating, cramping, and diarrhea. Sorbitol and mannitol, being sugar alcohols, are often present in um, sugarless candies and gums. During periods of moderate to severe diarrhea, patients are encouraged to lower and moderate their fiber intake. Fiber can be divided into two categories. There are the soluble fibers and the insoluble fibers. Insoluble fibers promote bulk in stool and encourage bowel movements. An example of an insoluble fiber is wheat bran. We encourage patients to avoid insoluble fibers during periods of a flare-up. The soluble fibers, on the other hand, an example being oat bran, help control diarrhea, and we recommend to, patient, to patients that they take sources of soluble fibers during a flare. In the event of extensive small bowel disease or extensive surgery to the small bowel, a patient may malabsorb fat. In these situations, what we do is advise patients very carefully to moderate their fat intake because over-restriction of dietary fat is not helpful either. 
over restriction of dietary fat can cause weight loss. In some cases, what we do is we advise patients to take a special type of fat, one that's called MCT oil. When patients are malabsorbing fat, they may also be more prone to kidney stones. In this situation, a patient who is malabsorbing fat may also be advised to take a special type of calcium supplement that's called calcium citrate. People with Crohn's disease will have more difficult time absorbing uh, energy, nutrients, vitamins, because it, affect, it may affect their small bowel. So if you have inflammation in the small bowel uh, or fistula, or you had surgery which uh, reduced the length of your small bowel, you will have malabsorption of uh, nutrients. On the other hand, in ulcerative colitis, because the inflammation only involves a, the colon or the large bowel, you won't have malabsorption of nutrients. A medication can impact the uh, absorption of nutrients in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, to give you examples, uh, patient uh, taking sulfazalazine or salazopyrene uh, may have a reduction in the absorption of folic acid, and that can produce anemia. Um, if you are prescribed cholesteramine, which is a bile acid binder to reduce diarrhea, it may also bind uh, certain vitamins, as well as reduce the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A, D, E, and K. So you may uh, progressively have deficiencies of these vitamins, uh, and it can reduce calcium in your bones, it can reduce your, uh, produce some night blindness from the vitamin A deficiency, or it can give you bruising and uh, bleeding tendency uh, because of reduction in vitamin K. Uh, antibiotics also can affect vitamin K. So uh, if you're on antibiotic for a long period of time, it will reduce uh, the bacteria in your uh, gastrointestinal tract, and the bacteria are very important in the production of vitamin K. So because you reduce the number of bacteria, you may have a reduction in absorption of vitamin K. Corticosteroid, very frequently used in inflammatory bowel disease, will also reduce uh, the absorption of calcium and uh, vitamin D. So again, uh, you may have a reduction in the calcium uh, in your bones and uh, an increased risk of uh, fractures. Surgery can impact uh, nutrition and nutrient absorption in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, in ulcerative colitis, uh, total colectomy uh, do not affect absorption of food in the small bowel. So in uh, these patients, uh, they will be able to maintain a good nutritional status after the surgery. So in ulcerative colitis, there's not much of an impact as you can have an impact in Crohn's disease. In Crohn's disease, you can have different type of surgery. One surgery is the removal of the terminal ileum. That can affect the absorption of vitamin B12 and bile acids. The uh, removal of longer segment of the small bowel may also affect absorption of energy, fat, protein, uh, carbohydrate, as well as vitamin, uh, and you can have uh, a reduction in your weight after this surgery. Certain type of surgery can also affect the mixing of food with enzymes, and that also will reduce absorption of nutrients and may affect your weight. And uh, uh, in addition, a certain surgery uh, will increase uh, the bacteria in your uh, small bowel. It's called bacterial overgrowth, and that can also reduce the absorption of certain nutrients like fat. There's a number of nutrient deficiencies that you may be at risk for when one has inflammatory bowel disease. I'll give some examples. Energy is an important one. Protein is also important. And then there's a number of vitamins and minerals, including vitamin A, B12, C, D, E, folate, and the minerals iron, zinc, and selenium. The focus for a moment on energy. Lack of an adequate energy intake makes one feel fatigued. Um, sometimes a patient benefits from supplementing their energy intake through carefully planned snacks and also potentially by taking a oral liquid supplement. A patient uh, may require a lot more protein than normal because of a lot of cells being lost into diarrhea and cells contain a lot of protein. This treatment strategy here would be to take um, a lot of high protein foods and these include 
meat, fish, poultry, and sometimes legumes. Patients with inflammatory bowel disease may be recommended to take a multivitamin mineral supplement to augment a healthy, well-balanced diet. In some cases, that multivitamin mineral supplement may not be quite enough, and I'll give a couple of examples. Iron is a nutrient that is required to uh, produce red blood cells, and when one has bloody diarrhea, one loses a lot more, a lot more red blood cells, including iron. So somebody with inflammatory bowel disease may require uh, an iron supplement. Another nutrient that is uh, important to consider is calcium. Patients with IBD may be at greater risk for osteoporosis, and taking uh, a high level of uh, calcium will help resist that. Generally, uh, a lot of the nutrients that patients with IBD are at greater risk for being deficient of um, are lost through uh, bloody diarrhea or are lost in greater quantities because more is required uh, during periods of inflammation. So a multivitamin can help to ensure that an individual is getting enough of them. But at times, a patient may be advised to also take a specific vitamin or mineral on top of taking a general multivitamin mineral supplement. Not all patients need B12 supplementation. Patients with ulcerative colitis do not need B12 supplementation. Patients with Crohn's disease who have uh, a inflammation of their uh, terminal ileum, which is the portion of the small bowel that is close to the colon, uh, or have an, a, a resection of their terminal ileum, may need vitamin B12 supplementation. It is very important to monitor vitamin B12 after the surgery, or if for a few years a patient had chronic inflammation of this segment of the small bowel. Uh, why is it important to monitor? because if you have vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, you may have anemia, and you may also have some neuro neurologic complication, like having difficulty walking because of a balance problem, okay? So once uh, we find out that you have a reduction in the absorption of vitamin B12, uh, we need to give you either oral supplementation, if it's a very short segment that was removed, or you need, uh, on a monthly basis, uh, injection, intramuscular injection. Mm -hmm. I often get asked whether or not there's any similarity between Crohn's disease and celiac disease. Both diseases are characterized by inflammation in the small bowel, but that's where the similarities end. Celiac disease is characterized by an intolerance to gluten. Gluten is a protein that is found in rye, wheat, barley, and oats. When a patient with celiac disease stops eating foods that contain gluten, their inflammation disappears. This is very different for a patient who has inflammatory bowel disease. They don't have an intolerance to gluten such that they can continue eating foods such as wheat and barley. Some patients will tell us that they experience an intolerance to beef. This is a very individual phenomenon and uh, certainly scientists haven't been able to explain the reason why. It is important that if a patient does experience an intolerance to beef, that they do include other sources of protein in their diet, including pork, fish, poultry, and legumes. Fish oil has an effect on inflammatory bowel disease. There's a biological uh, rationale for this, uh, because you have omega-3 fatty acid in fish oil, and that can reduce inflammation. Now, there are some studies showing that when you have active ulcerative colitis and you take fish oil, you may have a reduction of your activity. This means a reduction of the inflammation of your large bowel. In Crohn's disease, when your disease is active, it doesn't have an effect. But one study published in New England Journal of Medicine about seven years ago showed that if you take fish oil in remission, it may actually prevent flare-ups. So you have a better chance of maintaining your remission by taking fish oil in Crohn's disease. Now, one other way, sometimes it's difficult to take uh, fish oil capsules all the time because you have to take a lot of capsules per day. One other way to increase your omega-3 fatty acid intake is to take at least three uh, meals of fish per week. Uh, 
the type of fish that uh, had a high content in omega-3 fatty acid are tuna, salmon, um, sardine, mackerel. And you may also have other source of omega-3 like uh, flaxseed uh, uh, and uh, um, foods that are enriched in omega-3 like eggs, for example. Certain oils also have a higher um, content of omega-3 like canola and soybean. Well, there are two, two key areas of research right now in inflammatory bowel disease. One involves genetic research, and the other one involves uh, the intestinal bacterial flora. In terms of the genetic research, uh, the, the goal is really first to find genes that can be responsible for inflammatory bowel disease, and there were recent discoveries on certain genes predispo predisposing to inflammatory bowel disease. Um, in terms of intestinal bacterial flora, um, there is uh, some research suggesting that by modifying this flora, you can actually modify the disease activity. Um, I think it's important to add in terms of nutrition that nutrition actually can influence the gene expression and may also influence your intestinal bacterial flora. So there may be also a role of the environment and nutrition interacting with genes and intestinal bacterial flora, and this may affect the disease activity. There are no hard and fast rules as to guidelines that patients with IBD can follow. But what we can say is that a patient should tr strive to eat a healthy, well-balanced diet, to be on guard if their appetite fails them or they experience food intolerances. There is no one diet for all patients with IBD. It's important that a patient understand which part of their bowel is affected by the disease and what kinds of complications they have. A patient should see a dietitian and spend time with their physician understanding what a healthy diet is for them and to help them work through some of the intolerances they may experience. After all, what a patient is striving to do is be as healthy as they can be, be as well nourished as they can be so that they can feel their best and cope during flare-ups better. Tens of thousands of volunteers, members, donors, and sponsors across Canada are with us in our mission to find a cure. We hope you will become part of the CCFC team today. By volunteering your time, participating in our fundraising events, or making a donation, you will be contributing to research that is helping to find a cure. For more information, contact the CCFC at 1-800-387-1479, 416-929-0364 in Toronto and area, or visit our website at www.ccfc.ca. Help us find a cure.